The truth may set you free, but according to epidemiologist Martin Kulldorff, can also get you fired from Harvard University. Four years ago this very week, the United States began shutting down due to the threat of COVID. Professor Kulldorff, uh, professor of medicine at Harvard, favored a more targeted approach with respect to lockdowns, school closures, and eventually with the COVID vaccines. And now he is no longer an employee of Harvard. He is, however, with us today to explain why he was fired and why he believes his approach to the pandemic, views that also got him widely censored on social media at the behest of the federal government, has been vindicated. And he joins us now. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, I've wanted to hear from you for a while. You are obviously one of the individuals, along with um, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, who was, uh, whose content was driven off social media. And now we know because uh, members of the government, government agents, disagreed with what you had to say. But why don't you speak to us first about why you are no longer employed at Harvard? Well, since 430 BC, we have known about infection acquired immunity during the Athenian plague. Uh, so if you've had COVID, you have immunity that's superior to vaccinations. And we know that's true for the COVID vaccine as well. But uh, Harvard wanted to institute mandates uh, for, for vaccines. Uh, and I already had COVID. So I, together with many others, were fired. Uh, although there was also many who was given um, an exemption, so they were they were exempt from this requirement. But I was not. When you were fired, I presume you made an argument about the lack of medical need, given what the science had shown, for you to get vaccinated to have any kind of pre protective effect for yourself or others, given that you had already had COVID. Did you make a scientific argument to those in charge of? you know, terminating your employment, and what kind of response did you get, given that you are a doctor who has more authority to speak on the subject than many others in your position? So uh, I did make an argument. Uh, one is that I had already superior immunity. Also, I also have a genetic immune deficiency, which makes it sort of more risky and, and uh, hard to know what a vaccine will do to me. So I made both of those arguments. It's called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, I also made the argument that, uh, uh, maybe more jokingly, that since uh, uh, these vaccine ma mandates, since they sort of de facto deny uh, two and a half thousand years of, uh, uh, of knowledge about infection-acquired immunity, that's sort of a religious dogma that they were pu pushing. And therefore, I want a religious exemption uh, <laughs> because they don't believe in their religion or vaccinated people who don't need it. Uh, but it's both uh, very unscientific, uh, these things, but it's also unethical because let's, for argument's sake, let's assume that these are the best, perfect, most perfect vaccines ever. Then why would you force it uh, and give it to people who don't need it because they already have superior immunity when they are older people at high risk of COVID that still haven't been vaccinated and there's a shortage of vaccines, including my 87-year-old neighbor or people in Brazil or Nigeria or India? Uh, so there was a vaccine shortage, but they were forcing people to take it who didn't need it, while there were people who were at high risk of COVID who didn't get the vaccines. Right. Uh, to that point, as you write in in, uh, in your piece that you published about uh, you uh, having to leave Harvard, uh, you were also had to leave a CDC advisory panel on vaccines for actually opposing the pause of the J and J vaccine because you argued it was it was actually so important to get it to people who had not yet had COVID to o older people or at risk people um, that you actually thought that was a bad decision. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I'm probably the only one who's been fired by CDC for being too pro-vaccine. <laughs> uh, so there were some blood clots in younger women. So it was it was natural to do a pause on the younger women, but they are at low risk of uh, COVID anyhow, uh, COVID mortality. They can obviously get COVID. So I think there was uh, uh, it was not good to pause the vaccine for older Americans, uh, especially since this one dose vaccine was important for they're hard to reach people, like people in rural areas or homeless people, which you can only reach maybe with one dose. So uh, uh, I, they, they paused this. They did change their minds four days after they fired me and sort of approached and did what I suggested. But uh, uh, it was kind of too late. The reputation of the vaccine had already deteriorated and they were already plummeted. So I think uh, uh, I think some people died because they didn't get this J&J &J vaccine. 
Mm. So you were fired from Harvard ostensibly because you wouldn't get the vaccine. Now we live in a very different kind of COVID climate where the Democratic president of the United States has all but declared COVID is over, has ended all of the COVID era programs, and the CDC has revised its recommendations, now allowing people to go back into work on a much quicker, more abbreviated schedule than was previously medically uh, recommended and ended. And frankly, even Harvard and many other places have ended those same mandates. So, so what do you make of that? Because there are people on the other side of this that say um, those kind of decisions, some of those kind of decisions are being motivated by business interests. The initial, as I understand it, the initial um, uh, quarantine timeline was advised by the airline industry because they were having staffing issues with their flight attendants and the like. What do you think from a medical perspective is advised when people are trying to make assessments as to when to return to work, when they are or are not contagious uh, after having um, contracted COVID? So yeah, Harvard, uh, last week, Harvard finally ended its vaccine mandate for students, which was a good decision. But the pandemic is over. Uh, but COVID will live, be with us forever. It's never going to uh, disappear, but it will be endemic. And it will be very similar to the other four coronaviruses that we have lived with for at least a century. Uh, they will occasionally give us a cold. Uh, but since we've had been exposed previously, it doesn't pose the same danger anymore uh, because we have some immunity. It's not like measles. When you have had measles once, you can never get it again. So you, you can get COVID again. But the next time uh, the body, sort of the immune system, knows how to deal with it, so uh, you are very, have a very low risk of dying from it until you're 93 years old and you have a very weak immune system and you might die from some, some virus, but it could be influenza or it could be COVID or one of the other four coronaviruses. So I think we should treat it, it's endemic now, we should treat it like any other by circulating viruses that we sort of have lived with for hundreds of years. Can I ask you about that? Just, I think the concern that people have, and I know that research is ongoing and there's some conflicting reporting about this, but I wanna ask you, the concern that is that COVID might be different from some of these other viruses in so far as it may or may not have different long-term effects and interact with the immune system differently than other kinds of ailments. Do you have concerns about making kind of public policy decisions now before long COVID is better understood? Or are you skeptical about the real dangers that long COVID presents at all? Uh, so almost everybody have had COVID by now. So in that sense, uh, it won't make a difference. But I mean, from every virus, including influenza, there are some people who have long-term effects. So that's true for COVID also. Uh, but I don't think I, have, I, don't, I haven't seen any studies showing that uh, uh, long COVID is any worse than long influenza. Well, so, I've never um, help me understand because I've never heard of long influenza. Maybe that is a, a, a thing, but I my understanding is that uh, frequent uh, recurring cases of COVID, even people who are very COVID skeptic, uh, skeptical, uh, Dr. Vinay Prasad and I talked about this um, some months ago. That he even he would acknowledge a. Uh, heightened risk of having long-term effects and poor recovery from COVID the more times you have it. Even as young, healthy people, it's a kind of a frequency issue that seems to compound the risks of harms. So I wondered if you could speak to folks who might have that sort of a concern. Yeah, so I don't really, I, ha I, I haven't, uh, I don't really know. So I can't really say one way or other sure. about frequent recurring of COVID. But uh, if, I mean, we don't talk about long influenza the terminology but there are certainly cases where people have influenza or they have either viruses and there are long-term effects from it. So that's something that has existed for forever. And I haven't seen any studies that shows that these uh, uh, long-term effects are worse from COVID versus other uh, viruses that we're used to dealing with. Can, before we let you go, can you comment on um, you know, the suppression of the of the viewpoints that you and people who thought like you shared that happening on on social media and and, and your views and, and response to um, how you've been treated and stigmatized for speaking up and expressing your opinion on lockdowns. You know, we're we're actually four we, four years almost to the day, I think, right now for when covid first caused, you know, ev everybody to advise shutting down and, and the pandemic really kicked up. Um, you know, why don't you reflect on, on the journey you've been on and trying to get your viewpoint out there? 
Yes, if you told me four years ago that I would be censored when I said sort of basic uh, fundamentals of public health, I would not have believed you. I would just laughed at you. But I have been censored by Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, YouTube. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's very surprising. And, and we know that some of that, at least some of it, was at the behest of the federal government. I was, for example, I was asked, asked a question about the vaccine, and I said that vaccines are important for older people because they are high risk, but not uh, not if you've already had COVID because then you have natural immunity uh, and not for children, and that was censored. And I was suspended for uh, about three and a half weeks, I think, from Twitter and uh, for a shorter period of time from LinkedIn. So uh, to me, if you have science, I want, if I have a disagree with somebody in science, I want them to be able to say it. I don't want to censor them because I want to sort of refute what they're saying and have a discussion with them. And this thing of, of uh, censoring and, and suppressing certain views, scientific views, uh, is very strange. Uh, it's strange even if they are false, but in this case, I, I think those of us who were censored were actually saying the things that were accurate. Mm. And uh, there's actually a, a, a case now uh, uh, that uh, we filed a case to have the federal prevent the federal government from uh, 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 pressuring social media companies to censor people. And we won in the district court and we won in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal. And on Monday, this coming Monday, the Supreme Court will hear the case. So it's a First Amendment case. It doesn't involve any money, but it's a very important, I think, First Amendment case. So it'll be interesting to see what the Supreme Court says. Certainly. Missouri v. Biden, we are very much going to be paying attention to that on this show. Uh, Professor Koldorf, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks, both of you. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you.